online event with um, Fian International, um, Wai Anger, and the University of Miami School of Law. Um, I have to give you some technical uh, information to, to, to start with. Uh, I have to tell you that it will be recorded. Uh, participants, you can use the chat function to send questions. Uh, and we'll make, try to make sure that uh, panelists will receive the questions and, and be able to have the time to answer the, your questions. Please do, please do not um, raise your hands, uh, but ask questions on the chat. And the last technical point, um, please mute uh, yourself during the whole uh, uh, session. So it's uh, the, the, the title of uh, our event is Rights Not Charity, Solutions to Hunger and Malnutrition in the United States of America. Um, we all know that the COVID-19 pandemic is having detrimental impacts on the most vulnerable in the whole world. And today we will discuss its impact on the right to food in the US and uh, the false and through solutions to ending hunger and malnutrition proposed in response to this crisis in, in, the, in the US. Uh, before introducing the, the, the first panelist, um, I will give you some information about the Universal Periodic Review because this uh, online event is organized uh, in the context of the UPR that will be taking place in, in November. In so at the Universal Periodic Review, uh, created in 2006 by the Human Rights Council, this body, the Human Rights Council, examines each, each state every four to five years. The US has been examined in November 2010 and in May 2015, and it will be re-examined uh, for the third time in November 2020, so in a few weeks. Three documents are uh, at the basis of the UPR examination. First, a compilation produced by the Office of the Commission for Human Rights on recommendations made by UN treaty bodies and special procedures during the period covered by the examination. This compilation uh, is, is a 10 pages document. Then the, the second uh, document that is the basis of the evaluation is the state report. And the third uh, uh, document is the civil society contributions. And again, the Office of the Commission for Human Rights is, is, uh, uh, um, has prepared a compilation of 10 pages based on all the contributions by civil society organizations in the US. And in this particular, uh, with this particular case uh, of the US, we had received 140 contributions from civil society. So that's a huge number. And all of these recommendations are on OHCHR website. Um, at the end of the UPR process, uh, the US will receive hundreds of recommendations that it can accept or reject. In, 19, in, in 2015, it received 343 recommendations. It accepted 150 of them and took note, i.e. reject 193 of them. To, to give you just a few examples, it accepted, for example, a recommendations made by South Africa to recognize economic, social, and cultural measures, not rights, and strengthen efforts in ensuring equal access to healthcare and social services. However, it did not accept recommendations made by other states to better protect the rights to food, health, housing, education, water, and sanitation. So when it is about uh, recognizing and protecting rights, uh, uh, and especially economic and social rights, the US didn't accept the recommendations. But it, when it's, we talk about our states talk about measures to be taken and not rights, then it has been accepted by the US government. Uh, now, let me introduce our first uh, speaker today, who is Alison Cohen. Uh, Alison is senior director of programs at Hunger. For the past 27 years, she, ha she has worked uh, with grassroots organizations in rural and urban farming communities. Why Hunger, where she's based, uh, is, uh, is based in New York City. It works with allies and partners to hand uh, hunger and advise the right food in the US and around the world. Why Hunger is a co-founder or a member of Closing the, the Hunger Gap, the US Food Sovereignty Alliance, the Global Solidarity Alliance for Food, Health, and Social Justice, among others. It is also a member of glo the Global Network on the Right to Food and Nutrition, coordinated by FIAN International. 
In her presentation, Alison will give you an overview of the US political and social context relevant for the right to food. She will then introduce the next panelist. Alison, you have the floor. Great, thank you so very much. Um, Mary, you can, if you'd like, I've, I've, got, um, I've got a few slides and um, I'm happy to um, uh, just take you through those as well. Mary, do you mind just pulling up the, fantastic. Thank you. So hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today and for the opportunity to speak to you during this critical universal periodic review process of human rights. Thank you especially to the Geneva Academy, Fian International, and the University of Miami Law School for your collaboration in pulling this public conference together. This is an important moment for those of us who have been organizing around the right to nutritious food in the United States. We're here today because we recognize that framing an end to hunger in terms of the right to food can connect seemingly disparate peoples and struggles from around the world. That includes black farmers in Georgia and Mississippi, farm workers in California, fisher people in the Gulf of Mexico, indigenous communities such as the Wabanaki and Mohican in the Northeast and the Navajo and the Tone Otum in the Southwest, school children in urban areas and food chain workers and meat packing plants throughout the Midwest. We're here today to amplify the lived experiences of those confronting food insecurity in the United States and to contribute to the shared analysis of social movements across the globe about the true and false solutions to hunger. We're here today as an act of solidarity with people all around going for the right to food. Next. Next slide, Mark. Sorry, go, if you could go back one, please. My job in the, in the very few minutes that I have today is to characterize in, in broad brush strokes the social and political context we're facing in the US as we organize and knit together communities to transform the systems, policies, and institutions which perpetuate poverty and therefore food insecurity. COVID-19 for us, for all of us, is a crisis within a crisis, which has brought us to this proverbial crossroads. Do we continue to accelerate food banking and the charity food aid model? Or do we hold our governments accountable and take collective action at the root causes of hunger? Next. There have been almost 8 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in the US and around 215,000 deaths due to the virus. More than 50 million Americans have filed for unemployment since the start of the pandemic and with frequent images in the media of long lines of people in cars waiting to receive free food, some for the very first time in their lives. The number of food insecure people in the US is expected to climb from 37 million to more than 54 million by the end of this year. That's one in three adult, adults and one out of every two children. The disproportionate spread of COVID-19 in communities of color have drawn into sharp focus the systemic racism present in the US food system, inequities that communities of color have faced since the founding of our country. Today, black families are twice as likely as whites to face food insecurity. Next. Throughout North America and Europe, within the borders of some of the wealthiest countries in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a massive expansion of food charities. In the US, appeals for donations of food and money are a new media constant, and the government is relying heavily upon food banks to redirect what we call, they call agricultural waste due to food chain supply stoppages. Of course, these community institutions are doing an essential and life-sustaining job of distributing food despite a massive loss of volunteers and the need to protect themselves and their clients from contracting COVID-19. However, and I think it's important to pause here and note, the private charitable emergency feeding system in the US, which is the largest and most sophisticated in the world, has historically never been able to meet the demand or make a real dent in the rate of food insecurity, which has hovered between 11 and 12% over the last 30 years. Even before the pandemic, as I said earlier, 37 million Americans were struggling to get enough food on the table, while four out of five workers lived paycheck to paycheck. 
It's simply not possible to food bank our way out of hunger. Next. We're witnessing a private charitable feeding system pushed to its limits that has for far too long filled what should be the protective role of our government. This in combination with vertically integrated just-in-time food supply chains that are fraying at the edges. Such consequences are exposing the true extent and root causes of the hunger problem in rich but unequal countries like the US. This is not a new crisis, but a deepening of fault lines that millions of working families, low-income people, and communities of color have been straddling since the US was formed. COVID-19 is heightening this persistent poverty crisis and allowing folks from around the world to see and many Americans for the first time to experience the deep contradictions in our food and social wel welfare systems and the resulting uneven distribution of wealth that hits women and children, black, indigenous, and people of color communities in the United States the hardest. Next. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you three colleagues of mine in the US who will address in more detail, rooted in their own considerable experiences, some of the false solutions we're up against and the true solutions that are already putting, being put into practice. First, we'll hear from Karen Washington, farmer, activist, trainer, mentor. She's lived in New York City all her life and has spent decades promoting urban farming as a way for all New Yorkers to access fresh, locally grown food. She's the co-founder of a national network of black urban growers called Bugs and a farmer who raises delicious organic food, which I know because I go to the Union Square Farmers Market and purchase it with four other women at Rise and Root Farm in Orange County, New York. Karen will address structural racism and food sovereignty. Second, we'll hear from Robert Ojeda, who's going to address immigrants' rights to food and border issues. As the Chief Programs Officer for the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona, Robert will give us his perspective on the problem with food banking in the U.S. and how many of these organizations, including the one he's worked, worked at for over a decade, are beginning to travel together down the pathway from charity to justice. Robert was born and raised in Peru, where he grew up farming. In his current role, Robert oversees the food bank's programmatic initiatives. And then finally, we'll hear from Rob Robinson, who is going to address the links between rights to land, housing, and food. Rob, an organizer and activist first and foremost, is a co-founder and member of the Take Back the Land movement, and is currently on staff at Partners for Dignity and Rights, which some of you might formally know as uh, Nesri, it was formerly called Nesri. After losing his job in 2001, he spent two years homeless on the streets in Miami and 10 months in a New York City shelter. He eventually overcame homelessness and has been in the housing movement based in New York City since 2007. Rob has worked with homeless populations in Budapest, Hungary and Berlin, Germany, and is connected with housing and land movements in South Africa and Brazil. Karen, take it away. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So I'm gonna start with by saying time and time again, we are told that we have a broken food system that has to be fixed. Let me start my video. I'll start again. Time and time again, we are told we have a broken system that has to be fixed. And there are many of you that believe that. I too at one time was guilty of drinking the Kool-Aid until I started to take a closer look, remove my blinders and saw who are the people in the field growing our food who are in the meatpacking facilities and warehouses working under deplorable conditions? Who are the people getting sick because of our food? And who are the people with power controlling our food? I realize the food system is not broken. It's doing exactly what it was intended to do, be a caste system based on race, economics, demographics. It is a system that is exploitative, extractive, and based on the principles of capitalism. Food, which is supposed to be a human right, has now become a commodity based on profits and not on people. In 1996, the World Food Summit defined food security as existing when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active lifestyle. Yet people in poor urban and rural communities are told time and time again, if they want food security, all they have to do is grow their own vegetables, 
give up soda and exercise as if by magic, eating vegetables and drinking water are going to solve the problems in the food system without looking at the institutional, environmental, and structural determinants that reinforce racism in today's society. A food system that was built on the backs of enslaved and indigenous people. There were treaties that were signed, but of course completely ignored. There were laws and codes prohibiting access to land and capital. The servitude of people of color, the unjust judicial system, and the displacement of people off their land built the wealth that we see amongst people with power and privilege. We have a food system which is less 1% farmland that's owned by people of color, yet the incidence of hunger, poverty, diet-related diseases are high amongst communities of color. And COVID-19 has definitely exacerbated the problem. Today, we have less than 40 million people living in poverty, folks. And yet we say we're the greatest country in the world where we grow enough food and we waste enough food, yet that food is not getting down to the people that need it the most. So folks, what happened to our food system in the US? For me, it went from a slave reality to a slave mentality. Starting in 1916 up until 1970, we observed the great migration of 6 million African-American people leaving the South, leaving their land, leaving their wealth behind because of racism and segregated laws. We saw small farms being replaced by big corporations, backed up when in 1970, then Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts said to the small farmer, get big or get out. We gone from diversity to monocropping of single crops, such as corn and soy. We've increased farm subsidies that in the 1930s was supposed to help the small farmer is now become a cash cow, a dumping ground for processed food entering our food system with no nutritional value. We gone from a local economy to a global economy due to trade agreements, home cooking to fast food eating, from seasonality to growing and eating everything all year round. The American diet, which was once largely plant-based, full of fruits and vegetables and grains, has now become animal-based. As a result, we have seen our caloric increase of calories increase from 2,000 to over 3,800 calorie, calories per capita. A subsidized charity-based charity food system byproduct of big ag ends up in poor urban and rural communities. Again, it's cheap with no nutritional value. It is estimated the population worldwide by 2050 will increase to size to 9 billion people. And most of those people will be in urban areas. Yet much of today's industrialization runs parallel with the advancement of technology and mass industrial production of food. But in the end, who benefits? We have government policies aimed at protecting big ag. So can we actually say we're much better off because we have a system that's less labor intensive, more efficient and specialized due to technology? We have nonprofits providing emergency food for people in need. However, it too has become part of the subsidized charity-based food system run by big ag. A food system based on charity and subsidy is not sustainable. It creates a never ending revolving door without addressing the real problem of an exploitative welfare system that keeps people and families in poverty. What we needed and what is needed is less dependency on capital in intensive inputs that extract and greater attention to the social and environmental principles that build communal wealth. We're talking about food sovereignty. One of the inherent principles of food sovereignty is that the equity in the decision-making process and the distribution of resources must be in the hands of the people, thus advocating greater control over food production and consumption by people who have been marginalized by those with power. Recognizing this tells you 
that the fool system doesn't need to be fixed. It needs to change. And that change starts with shifting power. Shifting power for those who have for so long used food as a tool to have power over others into the hands of those marginalized community, communities seeking to take back their power. Our system, our food system is on one hand complex, the other simple. There are dots along the way that we must connect from the person that plants that seed in the ground to the food that is on your plate. Together, this movement is ours. This food movement is ours to take back. We all must play a role in building a healthy food system that is fair, that is just, that is equitable. And it starts with each and every one of us. Allison, take it away. Thank you, Karen, thank you. Um, we'll now hear from Robert Ojeda um, from the Community Food Bank of Southern Arizona. Thank Robert. you, Allison. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, greetings from sunny Arizona. Uh, Allison and Karen have done a really good job of contextualizing uh, the food system in the US. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about food banks and what they look like and what we're doing to try to uh, shift as well. So I live in Arizona, Southern Arizona. Um, oh, thank you. There's, thanks. Me. So Southern Arizona is a, a community uh, that has a large population of, of immigrant families. Uh, we have a very close relationship with our brothers and sisters in Mexico, particularly in northern Mexico. Uh, we often face issues that we face in, in the Southwest, particularly now with uh, you know, climate change and, and those kinds of issues. And we're an, you know, agricultural state. We have quite a bit of agriculture and a, a large population of uh, migrant workers that come from Mexico and other parts uh, of Latin America, particularly, that are part of our community. Um, and next slide, please. And so, uh, we, a couple of years ago, we were considered a food bank of the year um, and we're part of the Feeding America Network. We are now, you know, we're in a mid-sized city, but we're considered one of the largest food banks in the network. And that was because of all the uh, food that we were able to distribute um, a couple of years ago. A lot of that food actually comes from uh, produce uh, from Northern Mexico. And I'll speak about that. Uh, when we first started about 40 years ago, we distributed, uh, you know, around 10,000 food boxes. Now we're now 264,000 food boxes. We serve almost 200,000 uh, people a year. <clears throat> and so, you know, for many, many years, we were going this grow, 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 grow approach to solving the issue. For the last 10 years or so, we've been asking the question, well, what are we solving? What problem have we solved? What challenges have we solved? Who have we asked? Uh, who has been part of this conversation? Uh, next, please. And so, uh, so the you know, 51 years of food banking, and here we go. You know, uh, you have food banks that have facilities throughout the country. We continue to invest in and uh, you know, in uh, becoming more efficient, and efficiency has been the measure. Uh, you know, how many how many pounds come in, how many pounds we distribute. But to Karen's point, we seldom ask those most closely impacted. We seldom partner with those most closely impacted around. You know, what do we really want to do in partnership? What is, should the role of food banks uh, be? So we we believe after years of engaging inside our organization that this is a broken system. We've heard that from, from Karen and Allison. We believe that food banking, the way it has been set up, it does not really uh, make a, a difference and that uh, we need to do something to change. Um, and from a very practical stance, we will become irrelevant if we don't shift, if we don't change. So our commitment for the last uh, uh, 10 years more intensely has been to really start shifting. And some of the things that have happened, for example, is that uh, funding has dramatically shifted for us. Uh, we used to largely fund our, you know, hunger relief charity work. 
uh, there's much larger emphasis now on funding our root cause work uh, and a commitment to that. We are committed internally also to hiring community experts, the real experts, not just your traditional food bankers who may have, you know, a, a, a more, you know, the more education in a traditional way. So the community experts, the real ones. Uh, the most exciting thing to me is that we are more and more using a different lens for how we prioritize and what we prioritize, moving away from like pounds uh, and efficiencies to really effectiveness and really a human rights approach. How are things interconnecting? What are the decisions? How are they impacting uh, the families that we serve, but also how are they, they impacting the folks who work in the food banking system to make sure that food gets to folks? Uh, next, please. Uh, one thing that we're also shifting uh, is that makeup of our board is shifting dramatically. Our next six board members, we have a commitment, are coming from the communities uh, that we serve. Uh, so after, you know, shifting and really uh, investing in understanding the needs by deep relationships, by practicing community ethnographies and dramatically shifting, of course, uh, no surprise to a lot of folks, but this is what we've heard over the years from the community we serve. It's about an equal access to healthy food, issues around social isolation, diet-related disease. We have 75% of our program participants have a family member with either diabetes or heart disease, and then lack of economic opportunities. So what to do with that? So our work in the last five years has been really, really targeted at really dramatically turning the, the ship at our food bank. Next slide, please. And then what I'll share with you is some of the things that we're doing. <clears throat> First of all, we want to shift our sourcing model. There's full commitment from an organi our organization. So the question we're going to ask is, uh, if we source food, uh, the millions and millions of pounds, what is happening to those workers that are working at these farms? What is happening with those warehouse operators that are working at these warehouses? And we want to make sure that we first ask those questions and then shift the model. And so one of the things, for example, we're working on is we're working directly in Mexico with the folks that, you know, all the produce that comes in to really make sure if we're going to have a meaningful partnerships that these uh, folks are going to practice, you know, fair trade practices or really uh, socially responsible practices so that the workers are, are being taken care of, supported, uh, they have a voice. The same thing with, you know, uh, other kinds of donors that we have. So the re our relationship with donors is going to shift dramatically. It took us some, uh, some uh, um, uh, uh, challenging internal conversations to get to this point, but our commitment is that the rights of those working and providing food is, is, is really vital to us. An example of this is that, uh, you know, we, we used to have a really small fund to support local small community-based organizations that were doing really exciting, meaningful work. That fund has grown dramatically. This year, we have up to $3 million of our budget that's dedicated uh, no strings attached to community-based organizations that are doing uh, work to really um, uh, impact their own communities without us necessarily having to be in the middle of that. So we're really looking forward to this conversation and we think that by shifting the sourcing model, we can impact uh, and, and, and support uh, changes that other food banks also wanna go through. Uh, next, please. Uh, another thing that is really, really important for us, we deeply believe, Karen talked about this, that you know, shifts in power are really vital. So we have a, a whole team of folks. We have more than 20 staff that are dedicated to building and cultivating leadership and supporting those talented people in, in communities to really uh, more uh, um, uh, regularly participate in public life uh, and us creating bridges for that. So civic engagement is a precondition for us for food security. And so people need to be making decisions in their communities. And we're, we're trying to practice that knowing that we're a large bureaucratic organization, but that is a deep commitment we have. Yeah, next. Uh, another thing we do uh, is that, every, uh, and Karen and Allison have talked about this, Food banks should be allies supporting organizations. Uh, and we shouldn't be the ones driving what's happening. Well, you know, and so we've shifted from like even how we measure success. Um, and, and one of the 
uh, one of the things that we really evaluate now is that we've moved away from efficiencies and really look at effectiveness and equity, uh, uh, particularly. And so uh, building capacity and partnership with, with organizations and communities is vital for us. Um, and one of the things uh, that we're doing is, is decentralizing our network. We don't want to continue to grow. We, in fact, we want to get smaller. So a, a lot of our resources are shifting and we know it's just part of the, it's part of change. It's what we can do uh, uh, as part of change. Uh, and so there's a great uh, investment to shift. Um, and then next, please. Um, let me go to the next. Uh, and so uh, one thing and last thing I'll, I'll share with you is that one of the things we're investing is, is in the building of cooperatives and supporting the local food economy. So we've invested in producers cooperatives. We are facilitating these processes, incubating, taking some of the risks. One of the most exciting cooperatives is a water harvesting cooperative that's uh, led by uh, uh, undocumented uh, workers. And so it's a deep commitment uh, from our organization to do this. And so we know we're not gonna feed ourselves out of this problem. We have to do something differently. Uh, and, uh, and so we're part of the Closing the Hunger Gap Network as well. And that is our commitment. We're taking a lots of risks, but as an organization, I think we, we believe that's the only way uh, that, that we uh, will be uh, really address some of the challenges we face today. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you so much. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, Rob Robinson, if you want to turn on your video and, um, and talk so, to us. Thank you, Allison. And I, before I go into my presentation, I want to thank the Geneva Academy, Fion, but I want to give special thanks to the University of Miami, where as an organizer and an activist, I have a long working relationship doing the work on housing and some work on land. Um, you heard in my bio that I'm one of the founding members of the Take Back the Land movement. Well, there is a Take Back the Land archive that is centered at the University of Miami. So I wanna thank that. But I've also worked closely with the University of Miami Law School. So thank you for this opportunity. And Part of that critical thinking that I've done in universities was forged by my relationship with Allison and the organization that she is with Why Hunger. Um, those are the folks who connected me to struggles in Brazil, which really broadened my thinking on human rights and this access to land, housing, the connection with water and sanitation. So it's the intersection of all that work. And I wanna thank Why Hunger and Allison for giving me that opportunity. So I, one of the parallels I, I want to make, or not parallels, actually connections that I want to make to the presentations on food, right? And just a little bit about land, because you can't grow food without land, right? And our federal government owns 640 million acres of land in the U.S., 100 wealthy owners in the U.S. in 2007 owned 27 million acres. By 2017, 10 years later, they owned 40.2 million acres. So that's clearly a bell and whistle of me that says land is a commodity. And that is at the center of our struggle, right? Access to land, land is a commodity. So how do we change that thinking? I think there's a number of ways we can do it. And just um, to not to show up the food folks, but the one incredible statistic that I've heard that has always sort of rubbed me wrong is 40% of the food produced in the U.S. ends up in a landfill. That's 136 billion pounds of food every year. And that has always shaken me at my core. I just don't understand how that happens. But I want to go back to this issue of land as a commodity. What happens when the control and ownership of land changes. I think Brazil has shown us its constitution is written in, in post-dictatorship that says land has to serve a social function. It has to be growing food or housing people. That changes that dynamic, that changes that relationship. It, it hasn't played out exactly that way, but we have juxtaposed that against the constitution in the US that is constructed on 400 years of controversial access or acquisition of land. And it hasn't changed, right? And that wealth has continued and stacked up over a period of time. So I think what we're talking about here is 
a human right and access in a different way, fundamentally changing our relationship to land. How do we remove land from the market? How do we decommodify land? I think is a big question. And I think that's gonna have an incredible impact on food production as we think about it a little bit different. There are treaty bodies, there are documents that are written that talks about what a human right is. And I think fundamentally the United States having written the universal or taken part in writing the universal declaration of human rights that started the UN, I think article number 25 is the article that I always hold as a standard bearer for me that says we all have a root, uh, uh, a human right to food, to housing, to adequate sense of security. And I think land brings that, right? The MST in Brazil has shown us when they get a piece of land that all of a sudden they can grow food. And you know what? All of a sudden you can take bamboo that is plentiful in Brazil and build an abode. More people come, there's a sense of community. That community starts to expand. Some of the things that are grown in that earth or that land that the folks have now access to can heal the sick. So it seems a lot of our social problems disappear when we have access to land. So I think at its fundamental core, we have to start thinking about a redistribution of land. If our federal government in the US owns 640 million acres, I think that would go a long way to changing people's lives if there was some type of reparation or redistribution of that land. Um, what is the government holding it for? Is it holding it as an asset? Is it looking to sell it to large corporations to do some of that agroecology that has been happening? Some of this, uh, you see folks growing crops and multiplying in record numbers big agroecology taking over land, um, land grabs going on, not only in the US, but around the world. So I think we have to think about our relationship to land in a different context and think of food in a different context as a human right. And then I'll finally touch a little bit more on human rights. And I'll, when we talk about economic, social, and cultural rights, I think food, land, and housing all fit under that. But we seem as a country here in the US to be more focused on civil and political rights. That gets a lot of attention within the UN. I've always challenged this position. I was uh, fortunate enough to be on a, a webinar prior to this one with all four UN special rapporteurs on housing. They were celebrating their 20 years of being together. And Maloon Kathari, the first rapporteur ever brought up this. Maloon was, you know, saw these struggles, similar struggles going on in India and brought up this topic that the focus of the UN sort of dis is dismissive of economic, social, and cultural rights. And I think we as a country have engaged that here and that needs to fundamentally change. But that's not gonna change by the UN changing it for us. It's gonna take us using the mechanisms within the UN to push back. This has to be a grassroots movement as Robert alluded to earlier, what people and Karen alluded to, people have to rise up, right? We have to organize our communities, not only locally, nationally, but internationally to make this change happen. So I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna go over. I can get very impassioned when I talk about these types of subjects. Hopefully you'll have some good questions and answers where I can add more information if I missed anything. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Rob. And um, I'd like to invite Robert and um, Karen to come back on the screen with Pristoff. And, um, and if you have particular questions or comments, if you could put them in the chat. Um, and uh, I wanna start out by saying that um, it is really all three of you um, spoke with such passion and with such um, commitment and clarity about um, what this struggle is about and um, and the parallels between this struggle in the U.S. and the struggles that um, our, our sisters and brothers and comrades are experiencing around the world and, um, and therefore um, you know, we, we need this to be a global movement and um, bringing this to the, um, into this particular context, thanks to the Geneva Academy, bringing to this particular platform is an opportunity for us to, to really continue to build that solidarity. Um, so thank, thank you, you very much, Alisa. 
Uh, as we are waiting for uh, some questions from the from the chat, uh, I maybe have some uh, reaction to what was said. I agree that it was two great present three great presentations. Uh, I think it's a very clear example of uh, a country where you have plenty of food, but the problem is not availability, but uh, of course accessibility and how people have access to food and and the causes of hunger that we analyze with Anna Maria and others since 20 years is uh, our exclusions and discrimination uh, always in every country and that's really the case in the US. Um, we also talk about uh, right food is linked to dignity and that people should not de be dependent on food aid for 20 years and the whole work of Robert and, and his teams. Um, I have some questions. Uh, Karen, you work on organic farming and local food production. We have a similar discussion in, in Switzerland, in Geneva, and the, it's not easy to link the right to food to, to the local organic production because it might be uh, more expensive than, than uh, imported production, uh, food. Uh, so how do you, do, do you deal with that? You know that, that this food that you can produce in your community that can be local and organic can maybe be not uh, uh, accessible, affordable for the, the poorest in the, in the community or in the neighborhood. Then I have a question maybe for uh, Robert. You talk about human rights based approach to, to develop to, 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 to the food banks. And I think that you very clearly explain what it means. Um, when you, we talk about human rights, we, we talk about the role of the state. So what, can, I mean, what should be ideally, let's say, the role of the states in, in all that. Um, and that's something for Rob. The, we have worked with Anna Maria for 20 years on, uh, with La Via Campesina. Uh, on uh, to have a UN declaration on the rights of peasants it was adopted in 2018 by the UN. Um, it all started in, as you know, in Brazil, but also in Indonesia and, and otherwise. So we fought for, for 20 years and now we have declaration that has two uh, article five and, and 17 on the right to land, in fact. So there's very detailed article saying that the peasants uh, have the right to land. And uh, so that's, that's uh, I think, a, a tool that now we can use. And we try to use that tool and we try even to include the, the declaration uh, on the rights of peasants in the UPR process. So that's also for maybe uh, something that uh, states can ask to the US uh, if they will one day recognize the right to land as a human right. Um, I think that's it for now. You wanna start, Karen? You're on mute. Yes, yeah, so um, when it comes to uh, growing food, you know, there's been, like I said, been a big uh, shift in terms of especially people from African descent and people of color who for so long had no contribution when it came to agriculture. I mean, the story behind agriculture was slave and slave mentality. And so why would you think that people would want to go back to doing that until people started to understand the narrative around why we were brought here. We were brought here because of our, our ability and our, and our intelligence when it came to agriculture. We grew, grew the food uh, for this country. And so now you're starting to see that shift in the narrative and you're starting to see a lot of young men and women of color wanting to grow food, wanting to go back to the land because at the end of the day, land is powerful. I think in this country, we also have a, a sort of disproportional um, narrative when it comes to food of organic food versus, you know, just food in general. And so again, that puts in the haves and have nots when you're asking people to eat healthy food that is supposed to, in a broad sense, be for all, but yet you have this paradigm where organic food, elitist food is more expensive. And so now you see people going into communities and getting land and starting to grow their own food because at the end of the day, they know exactly the food that is culturally appropriate, the food that is affordable, and the food that is nutritious to their body. So you see this huge, big urban agricultural movement that is spanning across uh, the country because at the end of the day, they know that going back to the land and having land is powerful and controlling their food system is powerful as well. Great, thank you very much. Robert, do you want to react? Sure, sure, thank you. Uh, appreciate the question. Uh, first of all, I would say uh, there's an ecosystem of opportunity to really change what's happening. And so, first of all, 
you know, uh, communities know what's best for them and they should be taking the lead and informing that. There's deep work that's happening in communities. So, so depth of impact is happening. What I think is, is lacking, it's very difficult to put it on nonprofits and others when it comes to, I think, uh, breadth of impact. And so broad changes um, uh, take much longer. I think, you know, while I appreciate the coalitions and the coming together and it's, it's, it's a powerful process, I think there's a role that government could play in making sure uh, that changes are happening in broad ways. Uh, there's also that, of course, we've heard it, uh, there's uh, this uh, indivisibility of, of issues that's happening, uh, you know, and so how can I uh, play my role as a food bank when I see, uh, as Rob was talking about, there are land ownership issues, there are housing issues that are impacting our families in Tubman, Arizona, for example. And so I think if, if government at the local level, the state level and national level played a, a more active role, I think we could have policies in place that would really make it, uh, you know, would drive change in, 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 in broader ways. I think that's what's definitely lacking. Thanks, Arat. Yes, Rob? Christopher, thank you for your, your uh, observation and your question. I think what we face in the U.S. is a narrative question, right? For a long time, human rights was something that was thought of as something different, something that was international, right? That's not our problem. We're this great democracy that we don't violate human rights. So there's, there's this problem that arises, right? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of citizens of the United States started to digest that narrative and believe in that narrative, right? So it's been a lot of hard work for people like Robert, Karen, Allison, and myself to change this narrative. Right. Um, when I first came into the housing movement, nobody was saying housing is a human right. Now I'm out in protests and in the streets and in rallies, and that is front and center, right? So people realize that what is happening around the rest of the world needs to happen here. And that's going to take a grassroots movement. And I agree so much with Robert that getting the government involved, we, we know right now that we have a uh, our political climate is one that we have at the federal level, a government that dismisses human rights at its very core, right? There's been a, a disinvestment in the UN. You know, we were funding the UN for a long time. There's been systemic disinvestment. But I think what is happening now, and the reason why I keep bringing up these connections with the rapporteur is Leilani Farhar, who just ended her mission as UN housing rapporteur, uh, carried, uh, continue to carry on this mandate about let's move, let's make the shift. Let's shift from talking about housing as a human right to making it a reality. So I've been working with her as she engages local governments in Canada to learn a process that this is a we problem. It's not an us versus them problem. And she's engaged local governments in a way that I think is really fascinating. And there, myself and a few other organizers from the US are are privy to those conversations and just sitting in the background and learning from that process and hopefully to employ and engage those processes here. But we need as a community to rise up and demand that those rights, you know, um, that, are, that are, our government is responsible for. You have to meet people's needs as a government. And that's the fundamental framing and foundation of human rights. So it's just pushing these narratives. So opportunities like the Universal Periodic Review is where we can do that. I've been engaged from the first one in November 2010. And until I go to my grave, I'll be involved in this process because I think it's a way for us to push out government in a way that the rest of the world shines a spotlight on them. And these stories about this great democracy have to be pushed to the side and, and questions have to be asked. What about human rights? What about meeting people's needs? I'd like to just add to, so we can have this sort of conversation amongst ourselves quickly, because I feel that, you know, Rob and Robert, we all know the work that has to be done, but how do we, filter it down to the common person, the person that's standing on that food line, the person that can't make their rent. And I think this is the job that we have to do. We know as organizers what to do, but we have to make sure that that message is, is, is it goes down to the common person who doesn't see it 
who doesn't feel that they're invested because they have so many things that they have to deal with. They have, like you said, a government that's ignoring climate change, that is just ignoring so many things that are, are potential harm to us. And so the question that I've been asked time and time again is that how do you get that message down to the person who is bringing their shopping cart uh, to a food bank? How do you, a mother who has to take care of so many children, uh, a person who's about to be evicted? And that's the biggest challenge that we have as organizers that we need to do. Fantastic. Now we have uh, uh, many questions on the chat, so I will just... Uh read them and then uh, ask you again to respond bef before we leave the, we give the floor to, to Ana Maria. Um, alors, um, so the first question is uh, for Rob. Uh, you talk about the social, fu social function of land. What about the ecological function? The uh, ecological function is just as important, right? So my organizing shifted, and I think Allison can attest to this, from speaking about housing to understanding food, water, sanitation, they're all connected. So that moves you into the, into the ecological function mm -hmm. of land, right? We have to have a better understanding. And just to quickly answer what Karen just asked us, I think that comes from political education. Shout out to Why Hunger for sending me to Brazil, where I got to learn at the MST school and understand all these social functions and be educated through a political education process. Latin America has a way. We need to learn from our comrades uh, across borders. Great. Uh, another question for you uh, on the 640 million acres owned by the U.S. government. Does it include national forests, national parks, and the like? It, it does. So, you know, it, it, that's a little bit unfair for me to push all of that, but half of that number is land that just sits vacant and, and serving no function right now. But okay. yeah, some, uh, half of that land is national parks, etc. Okay. Uh, maybe for, for Robert, uh, many states and local governments have made quick policy changes, very positive during the COVID crisis. Uh, do you think it's possible to, to make them uh, sustainable and, 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 you know, to, to keep this uh, momentum, let's say? I, I can speak for our context. I know we have uh, a great partnership with our local government. Uh, and for example, uh, we're working with them on the issues that Rob is, is talking about at our local level, you know, land ownership, talking to our county government about areas of, of our county that are uh, vacant uh, in, in these communities that could use them. And, you know, how do we make that available long term? And so I think COVID has done that in our community. Our, our city government approached us with funding to invest uh, for organizations that are doing innovative things in their communities, no strings attached as well. So I think COVID has been a great uh, eye opener for lots of folks around issues of like, how do we make this res uh, resilient? Because everybody has been strained. Everybody has been strained under the, the current system of uh, uh, hunger relief system. So I do feel strongly that there is an opportunity, not just at the local level, at the state level. And we are also seeing opportunities in Arizona. Um, and through closing the hunger gap, we, this, that's a network that uh, some of us are part of as well. At least I would say a third of food banks in our country are really doing innovative things to shift. And so to Karen's uh, point around sort of the education and awareness, I think we have a great opportunity to do more. If half of the food banks use their social capital to push for policy changes, I think we could do really, really meaningful things as well. So this, is, this seems to be the time for that. Can I just add um, very quickly that um, there, we do have many, many examples of um, local governments and state level governments that are um, uh, embracing human rights. Um, we have uh, the CEDAW cities. Um, we have in Maine on the um, uh, a referendum on um, the right to food, actually changing the state constitution of Maine to include the right to food. So many of these kinds of, um, of initiatives that, um, uh, and as we all I think know, they're bubbling up from from the bottom, and so to to, to speak to to Karen's 
um, point and Robert's point as well, that um, it's the, the organizing that's happening among those who are most impacted by um, hunger and poverty in, in this very wealthy but unequal country that is, um, uh, that's where the innovations are coming from. That's where the, the, um, the ideas and the, um, and the practices that are moving us towards, um, towards a right to food. I think, um, you know, we, as we all, uh, I think, are completely aware, the, the, the U.S. has not signed on to the um, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights um, uh, Convention. And, um, and so for us at this point in our organizing strategy, the right to food is a narrative tool. It is a, uh, an organizing, a community organizing tool so that we can begin to understand the, the holistic nature of the right to food and um and uh and 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 make our our case and our um build momentum around that great thank you very much uh two more uh things on the chat and then we we will move to the to the two other panelists one is from our friend from uh, Shri, uh, Fian Sri Lanka you are right he's talking about the the because i said that uh, uh imported food is can be cheap in the supermarket but of course it doesn't because it is cheap because it doesn't include the, all the ecological cost and the travel cost and, uh, and the social cost because it's, it's produced at the very uh, people producing it uh, are not very well paid, etc. You are totally right. And then there is a question on how you uh, uh, agroecology and food sovereignty are linked. And the question is, it says that agroecology now is pushed uh, in, in, by many institutions and individuals as one of the components of uh, food sovereignty or, or one of the way to, to, ex to, to, you know, to enjoy food sovereignty. And he says that some uh, 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 peasant communities voluntarily engage in the production of export crops, just as coffee uh, that negates the emphasis on, on local production for local consumptions. So how do you do, how do you, because if it's a, Food sovereignty is the right to decide what you produce, no? And so if, what if you, a community decides to produce to exports instead of doing agroecology and uh, producing for the local consumption? Well, isn't, when we talk about food um, sovereignty, it's really about the, um, the participation of people agreeing on taking back their power. So if you have, um, and I have this conversation all the time because we need to talk about the value and cost of food as a farmer. The food is not free. And there's a cost and value that comes with that. And so when we talk about food sovereignty, you're really talking about taking back the power, especially about the power by those who are for so long have had power over us, have, been, have used extractive ways of capitalism to gain that power. And so taking that back and talking about social capital and communal wealth as a way of building power within the hands of those that have been marginalized for so long. So, I mean, if people are coming together and working on ways that they can increase capital for the benefit of their community, I have no problem with that. The only problem that I have to, we have to make sure is that we never replicate the oppressor. We never replicate the capitalistic way of extracting so that at the end of the day it causes more harm than good okay fantastic i think that uh, that's that was we, we have to end now the, this first part of the debate but we'll have a, a, another uh, chance at the end to have a, a, a new discussion um and just to say that the Alison, it's great that you also responded to the question on the if the right food can be endorsed by some institutions, um, and um, and so there was a question for you, but we can we can also respond uh, separately maybe or by email by Molly Anderson on if there is a compilation of cities uh, that uh, have uh, you know endorsed human rights that are linked to the to economic social and rights. Um, okay, so now uh, we move to uh, the uh, presentation by Ana Maria. Suarez Franco and Denis uh, Cordova Montes. So Ana Maria uh, Suarez Franco is the Geneva representative of Fian International. Uh, she has worked for Fian International since, more than, since almost 20 years. Uh, Fian, uh, if some of you do not know, is an international human rights organization that was created in 1986 uh, to promote and protect the right food. 
it is present in many parts of the world. And so Anna Maria will propose an analysis of the problems presented and that we discussed from a right to food perspective. And then uh, I will give the floor to Denis Cordova Montes, who is the acting associate director of the Human Rights Clinic at the University of Miami a School of Law. She's a human rights lawyer. At the clinic, she works towards the promotion of social and economic justice globally and in the US and supervises law students work in cutting edge human rights litigation and advocacy at the local, national, regional and international levels. From 2012 to 2018, Denise was based in Germany where she coordinated the gender and women's rights program at Jan International. And Denise, she would propose, you, uh, she would present UPR recommendations to the US. So Anna, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Christophe. Uh, yeah, I saw that we, that we have some participants from states delegations in Geneva. So I think uh, they are waiting also for, for Denise's uh, recommendations and I, I will try to be brief. Um, as you maybe know, the new special rapporteur on the right to food lives in America, in the US and is uh, in the University of Oregon. And I would like to begin uh, this analysis with two paragraphs of his first report to the General Assembly, because I think that tackles very good the three main presentations uh, of tonight. He says, the right to food is not just the right to be free from hunger. It is the right for everyone to celebrate life through their meals and each other in communion. One of the most important ways that a community defines itself is through what, how, when, and with whom they eat. Communities are made through shared holidays, memories, receipts, palates, and manners of eating. Through these food practices, people create their social and political institutions. And then talking more to the issue of the relation with land that has been explained by Robert, he says, Food is also central to show people, uh, to, uh, to how people establish their relationship with the land. It is therefore a key element on how sovereign power is expressed. Food creates a hub that interlaces complex ecologies of certain humans, animals, plants, microbes, spiritual entities and landscapes into longstanding relations of care with each other. Kate Wise put succinctly, food production, labor, preparation, consumption, and disposal are woven tightly with the land tenure, a community's way of life, reciprocal gift giving, and life uh, sustenance, connecting people in a community and respect for non-human life. And I think this is very important to, na to a common element that the three of you mentions, and this is that food now is a commodity. And this is exactly how food security sees food as a commodity that needs to be on the table of people independently on how it is and how it is obtained and how does that relate, re, uh, relate to the communities that produce, exchange and eat it. Therefore, we are not speaking here about food security, right? We are speaking about food as a human right, which means that states have obligations, that people have rights that can claim, and that this is not about charity as the title of the event. Also on the, under the food, uh, right to food uh, approach, the focus shall be on the marginalized and disadvantaged people in communities to treat them with dignity, right? And I think all what I said is kind of contradicted in the presentation of how the system is working that you did today. So let me go through some elements. It, it was very rich, so I will not tackle everything, but some element of each one. When, uh, when uh, Karen has uh, uh, been speaking about the food system. Uh, for me, it was clear that the state is not complying with its obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food of people 
but it seems to be that this is more about protecting the interests of private big corporations. Therefore, also favoring concentration of life and wealth. And this has on the other side of the coin, the discrimination that has been presented. Discrimination is a violation against the right to food and all human rights. Also, the violations of the rights of workers are against the International Declaration on Human Rights and the Human Rights Standards Valid that the UPR looks as a basis to define how states implement their human rights obligations. This system is affecting access, not just because it is discriminatory, but because the real cost, that means the health cost, the social cost, the cultural cost, even the spiritual cost is socialized. That means everyone of you in the US pays for people getting sick because they are eating uh, ultra processed products while the profit is privatized. This is for some. And it also uh, affects the availability because the, the way in which this system is producing is destroying the environment. And therefore, the production of food for future generations, or even for our generation, is in danger. Also, the, the adequacy of food is affected, and I don't need to see, say much. We know that the food produced and, and uh, consumed in the US is mainly ultra processed and causing, therefore, the, uh, the big problems that you have. When I were, was uh, hearing the presentation of Robert Ojeda on food banks, I remembered a, a big debate that we have been having here also with the states for ages to explain that even if food banks can be needed in some emergency situations, they should not be the structural solu solution to hunger, right? Because first, they are not based on the state's obligations. They depend on private uh, charity. Second, in many cases for people, it's not dignified to have to go to the food bank to pick up food, while through a first uh, security, social security system, it could be more in line with dignity. And third, because it helps the state to dismantle social security. So uh, I was very well surprised by the explanation because the fact that you are trying to change the sources to change the way you define who should receive the food and especially the engagement of the community in uh, performing the policies and making the state responsible for what it has to do is the way to go. The provision of food, the assistential provision of food should be the last resource. In fact, first, we have the obligation of states to fulfill and facilitate, which means facilitating that people can feed themselves, for example, to adequate working conditions and salaries, to access to land, to access to social security, among others. And finally, when I was hearing Robert, of course, uh, the first word that came to me was the right to land. In, in the Declaration on the Rights of Peasants that Christophe was mentioning, uh, there was a big conquer, and this is that for the first time, an international instrument negotiated by states recognizes land as a right. What does it mean? That we are going away for the way in which the colonies saw the relationship between people and the land, which was the right to property. When, when the colonizers came, the land was there and people have the relationship through tenure, traditional tenure. And property was used to say, oh, it's not just more land because I have this paper. So this, this is my land. And that was the way how it began uh, not just serving to the elites, but also becoming a, commu a, co a commodity. And nowadays, this commodity is in the stock markets. That means there are two realities. The realities of the people who use the land and live from the land, and the reality in the st stock markets where big powers exchange and speculate with our land. And this helps to, to concentration of land. So it is against the right to food because it puts the power on those who have the money 
and the control of our societies while marginalizes those who need the, the land to feed themselves and to live in dignity. And therefore, this way to relate to land is also contrary to the human rights standards. I would finish here just saying that uh, it, is, it is a bit a paradox that very good special reporters on extreme poverty and human rights nowadays on food and also the new special reporter on toxic substances live in the US and work in universities in the US. Uh, and I think uh, we should use these people. We invited them to participate today. Unfortunately, they couldn't. But I think we should also ensure that they in the report uh, continue highlighting how the US is not complying with its uh, human rights obligations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna Maria. And now it's your time, Denise, to, uh, to present the UPR recommendations. Thank you, Christoph. Um, Mary, if you could go ahead and share um, the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Great. Um, well, as we have heard from our panelists today, um, there is an emerging critique of the permanence of the private charitable food banking system and a call for the holistic right to food and nutrition to be realized in the US. Um, and the recommendations that I'm about to present offer alternative solutions that include putting the health of people and the planet first, localizing and regionalizing food systems, agroecology as a practice and way of life, and strengthening social movements in the struggle for food sovereignty. This critique calls for food to be adequate and nutritious, economically accessible, environmentally sustainable, and to be produced by food systems that are controlled by the people. Um, the following recommendations, six recommendations that I will share with you are what we call true solutions to ending hunger at its root causes in the US. So first, um, next slide please, Mary. Um, the right to food and related economic and social rights, including right to land and housing should be recognized enshrined in law and enforced. The US should ratify the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in which the right to food is enshrined in addition to ratifying the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Until that happens, US courts should recognize the customary nature of the right to food and international law. Local governments such as cities, tribal nations, counties and states should also recognize, promote and protect the right to food of the residents. Secondly, labor policy should mandate livable wages, stable employment, adequate hours, safe working conditions, gender and racial equity, and the ease of union representation. Work remains the primary way in which people of working age require money with which to purchase food, acquire money with which to purchase food. Yet it has, been, it has become increasingly challenging for workers to make ends meet due to minimum wages set well below adequate living standards, especially in urban areas, um, due to unstable employment and difficulty in gaining full-time employment, due to the draconian immigration system, as well as the erosion of collective bargaining power linked to the decline of labor unions in the US. Uh, we call for our national and local governments to reverse these trends as part of their commitment to the right to food. Third, um, Robust and responsive government social protection programs should be well funded and depoliticized as essential elements of national food security strategies. The US political landscape has been influenced by several decades of neoliberal policies, and this has led to an, internet, to inten to an intentional shrinking of the government's roles in protecting social welfare, income assistance, and food security for all. The US government has a duty to protect their inhabitants and step up as the primary duty bearer to ensure the progressive realization of the right to food, including through social programs that address access to adequate food and nutrition, housing, health care, and a dignified life. Fourth, um, federal poverty guidelines or the poverty threshold should be updated to account for differences in the standard of living across the US and to include contemporary expenditures as a percentage of income other than food consumption, including childcare, healthcare, transportation, and housing. The official poverty guidelines um, treat poverty as absolute and focus on food consumption as the primary indicator. As a result, the federal poverty line is too low, does not reflect current living standards, and significantly undercounts the number of families that are struggling to put food on the table, 
keep a roof over their heads for parent or pay for childcare. Fifth, the US should end structural racism and discrimination against groups most affected by hunger and malnutrition. Structural discrimination reduces the ability of those most affected by hunger and malnutrition, such as people of color, women, indigenous peoples, and LGBTQ plus individuals from being able to achieve economic security and a dignified life. The US should eliminate policies that discriminate and instead the US should promote gender and racial equity the rights of indigenous groups to access water, hunt, and fish in accordance with cultural practices should be protected. The U.S. should consider programs that provide reparations to historically exploited and dispossessed groups to provide them with an equal opportunity to achieve economic outcomes. Governments should promote innovative methods of tackling urban food insecurity, such as urban farming. And finally, sixth, um, the U.S. should end its practice of confluence with the food industry in the form of commodity food programs, industry participation in congressional lobbying, and tax breaks for food donations to food banks. People, not corporations, should have control over food and anti-hunger policies. Unlimited and excess corporate lobbying has transformed anti-hunger policies into vehicles for subsidies to big ag and big food. It is vital to a democratic system for everyone to have their say in food and anti-hunger policies. So governments should ensure that lobbying does not minimize the voices of citizens and does not become a monetary tool that enables right to food violations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Two, uh, again, great presentations. Um, so we still have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, there is lots of uh, information on the chat um, about this, the many uh, experts of the UN who are in the US. Uh, there was also, yes, an addition uh, about Olivier de Scooter, who is a special rapporteur on the human rights and extreme poverty and uh, was the special rapporteur on right to food and he's, has also is giving courses in, at Colombia, for example. Um, the, and also the Robert Robinson uh, uh, told us that he is in the steering committee of the Human Rights Cities Alliance, uh, that uh, we have received the link on the chat and they will produce a letter uh, to encourage local governments to agree on human rights framework. So that's, that's fantastic. And the links sent uh, are also great on this alliance for human rights and the cities. Um, I think I, I, have a, uh, I have a question, I guess, for, um, for uh, Denise. The, you, you said that the, the right food should be recognized as a customary right. And I think uh, it, it's, uh, it has not been uh, uh, demonstrated by many scholars, but there are few that exist. And I would at least argue that the right to be free from hunger is part of customary law. It's in every state legislation in the world. You, have, you cannot let your children uh, die from hunger, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a prohibition in, uh, during armed conflict. It's, uh, I think we can argue that it's uh, at least this core content, let's say, of the right foot could be uh, is part of customary law. So the question is, can, can we litigate? Can you litigate the right foot in the US? And if yes, where? And if not, why? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, currently, the right to food, um, as far as I understand, has not been um, enshrined in any um, uh, state constitution or, or state law. And here I know that um, Allison mentioned sort of an eff efforts in Maine to um, amend uh, the state constitution to include the right to food um, in its constitution. Um, so indeed, as of right now, that hasn't happened yet. Um, I think creatively. Um, uh, I know that when my students and I were um, uh, together with other advocates, we're putting together the, the Civil Society UPR um, submission for the, for the upcoming UPR. We were trying to think creatively of how to talk about the right to food, given um, the fact that the US has not ratified the, the covenants on economic, social, and cultural rights. And um, we were trying to talk about it in the context of the, of the covenants on civil and political rights. And we started talking about political participation, the right to equality, non discrimination. Um, so we have um, ourselves, we're constantly thinking of creative ways to talk about the right to food given the context. Uh, but at the moment, indeed, it, um, because as far as I understand, it has not been um, adopted or enshrined in any state constitution. Um, uh, it hasn't been litigated in court. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, Karen, Robert, uh, Rob, do you want to, to react to, to what was said? I just, I, I, this is Rob. I agree with Denise. I don't have near the expertise of law schools and law school students. I always rely on them um, to support this. But one of the arguments I bring from the housing movement is, is similar. However, I think our country, and I mentioned this in my talk, that it is mired in a constitution that's 400 years old. So it's going to force us to amend that constitution that is obviously written in old language. But as I was doing my housing work, we always ended, especially with Take Back the Land, when we were taking back houses that were foreclosed, we would say the right to a home outweighs the right of a landlord or a speculator to profit off of that home. Right. And we give the visual of the scales of justice that Denise is so aware of that sits in all of our courtrooms. That's your scales of justice for the profiteers and and high level people. So I think it's incumbent upon us to bring these arguments into the courtroom. It's hard to get a lawyer to do that. But, you know, as we did in the housing movement and we saw this happening in Maryland, we kind of brought a group of people who were directly affected and brought in progressive lawyers who basically dared a lawyer to say you didn't have the right to a home. Be the first lawyer to go on record and say that. I dare you. And you know what? All of a sudden, the lawyers were, were being told by the judge, go in the back and see if you could litigate this or you could negotiate some type of deal, mediate this, right? So you can force change, but it's going to take a collaborative effort of people having the courage to go in. Many, many lawyers, and I'm not, I'm excluding, obviously, University of Miami because I have a great relationship with them, but many of the legal folks believe in that constitution. It's ironclad and they won't challenge it, but we need to challenge it as a people. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Karen and Robert, do you want to react? I, I definitely want to add on that. Listen, folks, we are in a critical time now in this government. And for too long, we have been complacent. For too long, we have allowed government lobbyists speak for us. Wake up, folks, and start making these people accountable. The only reason why they're in there, because you put them in there. You know what I'm saying? It's time for us to listen to. COVID has taught us who the essential people are. We're not going back. We cannot go back. So now's the time to step up and challenge the system. Challenge the system because at the end of the day, when people talk about government, well, who's the government? The government is the people. And it's time for people to galvanize together and change the politics around food, around housing, around the environment. The time is now. People get off your butts and start marching and start making sure that your vote counts and that the people in office are accountable. You have that right. Great, thank you very much. Ana Maria, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I, I want to go back to this question on the possibility to litigate. And, and I have to say that in many countries where we now have the right to food recognized, we didn't before. Also in the international, in the inter-American human rights system, uh, the human right to food has been recently uh, recognized by the Inter-American Human Rights Court even if it is not explicitly in the convention and in the protocol of San Salvador is just the right to nutrition. And I think uh, the tactic that, that we have been using since ages with lawyers working on economic, social and cultural rights has been to, to use the interdependency of the rights. And I think in these cases, uh, it's very easy to connect it to the right to life. And if you see on the last general comment of the Committee on Human Rights on the right to life, it does a great connection to economic, social, and cultural rights. It is, in the case of the US, very clear connected to the right to health and the impact on public health, especially taking into account the ways of production, but also uh, the ultra processed um, eatable <laughs> things, it's not food, that, that the majority of the, of the people have to eat. It's related to labor conditions, and I think labor law uh, could be also on the basis, and of course on discrimination, because those who are suffering hunger uh, are victims of patterns of discrimination. So I think uh, you can do it and not forget that uh, Henkin, uh, a, a very known professor, said the Universal Declaration is customary law. 
and the right to food is included in Article 25 of this customary law. So I think uh, we could do the arguments. The difficult thing is to convince politically and to get the political will. Arguments you always have from the legal, but that's why we need to move the people as many of you were saying. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robert, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to just add that um, we should be in the business of dismantling the current food banking model. That is what we're doing. I think we can't be complicit. I think for those of you food bankers who are feeling anxious about this, it's possible to do it. We can do it. It's our responsibility to do it. So, uh, you know, it's just so important that we think that way. We cannot be complicit. We need to dismantle this and it works. It's working. It takes, it takes time, but it can, it can be done. Uh, so my appeal to food bankers who are feeling anxious about these kinds of things, it is our responsibility to do this. Great, thanks a lot. Um, a, a last question maybe to Denise. Um, the, all, the six recommendations you made are fantastic and very progressive. Uh, let's, let's imagine that there is a new president in, on the 1st of January, 2022. Uh, is there any uh, expectation that these recommendations could be implemented? What, what is the human rights commitment of Joe Biden and his team? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, and um, indeed, I think there are many of us who, who are starting to, to think about, you know, what that world could look like um, if, if there is um, a change in, in presidents. Um, uh, we're starting to, to organize, to think together. I know we have an upcoming uh, meeting with um, some uh, strategy meeting with other movements related to right to housing, right to health, right to food, precisely to sort of start thinking about like what what are our asks and so that we can be ready if indeed there is a change um, in government. Um, I don't know if Alice and Robert or Karen want to say something more about the prospects of, of the right to food and food sovereignty under a new administration. I would just say quickly, Denise, that I think uh, we've learned from these processes in the past. So uh, we're counting a lot on the missions to ask the tough questions so that we get a report, an output report that we could use as a tool to go into our communities and organize. So I agree wholeheartedly with Denise. I, you know, I think it's gonna take ground up organizing to, to get investment in human rights by our government, whether there's a change or not. Um, I'm, and there better be a change, let me just say that, right? We definitely need a change, but um, I think we've learned what that output tool can do to us. So a lot of us are spending time having conversations with missions. You know, I've done uh, several briefings with missions as part of the US Human Rights Network, and we have another one coming up shortly. So, um, you know, hopefully we can make some headway. I think groups like this and getting together um, can, can make that happen. I would add that um, yes, we we definitely need a change, and we're we're all uh, working hard to bring about that change and hoping for it. And we can't we can't be fooled that that that's going to be you know that that the, that's not gonna, that's not going to be the tide that raises all boats. And so we are going to have to continue organizing and um, and as Rob said, really pushing um, building power. Um, at the at the grassroots level within communities, so that we can use the opportunity that a Biden um, Harris uh, ticket might might present. Karen, do you want to have the final word? We don't hear. We don't hear you. Muted, I think I think Anna Maria wants to have the final word. <laughs> okay. No, no, the final, oh. just one. Oh, yes, no, 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 no. <laughs> organize, organize, organize. Okay, good, fantastic. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that um, it is very important what you are doing with the preparation of the UPR, uh, but we also have to be prepared for the worst. You no, know? that means that our fruitful and good recommendations are not taken by, by the state. We know which government you have. And I think it's very important to have a strategy to use that. If a government publicly 
says that it will not do what the population is asking for the realization of the right to food that should have a social cost. Uh, and I, I expect that, that we can work together in thinking which will be this strategy, if we will put that in the press, if we are going to bring that to other fora in the UN, how uh, to learn from you, how are you going to work on this with the communities? Because I think uh, this is the kind of tools that we have now under the current political conditions. Okay, fantastic. So that was a fantastic meeting. Uh, uh, thank you everyone for the, all the panelists and all the people who participated online. Also on the chat, it was great questions you asked. Uh, let's hope that it will have an, an impact uh, also on the questions that will be asked to the states in, in a few weeks. And uh, bye everyone. Thank you, Christopher. Bye, Christopher. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you so much.